And as always, <clears throat> well, often, we have uh, people give testimonies, share testimonies. Last week we had Lauren share a testimony, it was awesome. And this week we're going to have Le uh, um, Leslie share a testimony. So Leslie, Yay. if you come and share with us, that'd be great. I thank you for the opportunity to share. You've come to know me initially as Doyle and Rhonda's sister-in-law. I've known Rhonda since I was 16, 17 years old. So we go way back. Then you came to know me as Lauren's wife and uh, your pianist and worship leader on occasion. I thank you for that opportunity. Truly, it is a gift from the Lord. And he has sustained me these many years in the expression of it. I'm very grateful. <clears throat> I could not have known as a little six-year-old when my parents got a big old black upright. I think it was given to them. <laughs> and back then, remember, people had parlors? So it was in my parents' parlor, and I'd go over and I'd start uh, tinkering around on those keys. And I remember even as a six-year-old, I loved that glorious sound. So as a six-year-old, I would layer all those sounds, and it didn't even matter if they matched, because I didn't know they matched, but I would hold down that sustaining pedal, and my parents would holler from the other room, get your foot off that pedal. <laughs> But, uh, you know, who would have known there was a gift in there? It was the Creator's gift. And over the years, as I'm nearly 60 now, I, I connect the dots. I realize 50 plus years later, as I look back over those years, the Lord has graciously bestowed this musical expression throughout my life because it lifts me emotionally. And um, it lifts my soul to worship. Um, my testimony, I think it helps. I heard the other day by Chuck Swindoll when Lauren had it going. He was sharing a testimony of someone else and he said, our words mean much more when we understand the context. Isn't that true? So you know what I'm going to say, you've got to understand my context. And that's why I've been so blessed, Roger and Sharon, Lauren, by our testimony so far because it's our context. It's our experience with the Lord, right? And where he has brought us to my testimony to the largest degree is interwoven from my family of origin in my formational years. There was tremendous and intentional pouring in and simultaneously me seeing it lived out. Such so that lifelong foundational pillars were set and remain firmly in my life. So what I share this morning regarding someone else I trust you will see has bled over into my own spiritual veins. And I'd like to start with a word of scripture, Joel 2.25, which says this, and I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. It literally means I will recompense to you the years. I will give you fruitful ones as a full compensation for those in which the locust ate up the fruits of the earth for some years running. It's a strange way to begin your personal testimony, isn't it? <laughs> but this verse, like a sturdy thread, runs through the fabric of my family or origin, so I'll come back to this. I have to begin really with my father, and I'm sure it goes a lot further back than that, but from my knowledge. My father grew up as a house painter's son, and his father before him. My grandfather was married six times but not all at once, so. <laughs> but we do remember my father saying that it seemed like every time he turned around there was a new mom in the house. My dad's father and my grandfather worked very hard, but there was really no time and no quality time spent with his three boys. They divorced and my dad lived some years with really the only person he ever knew who was a Christian and that was through the Pilgrim Holiness Church, remember, way back then? That was my dad's grandmother. But the implications of my dad's dad, married six times, and then slapping the boys around and really no love there, the implications of those two realities for my father would have naturally led to a history repeating itself. But as a young man, my dad set out on his journey in life, 
And all he tells us is he knew in his heart two things. I want to be married to one woman for a lifetime. And I want to spell love, T-I-M-E. And in time, my dad met my mother, and they married and eventually had eight children. The firstborn, a son, my brother, and the secondborn, another son. But he was born with a hole in his heart, and at three months old, he had a stroke. So I remember my brother Andy in a wheelchair, limp on one side, and a boy of extreme happiness to all. He was always so happy. My dad and mom did not know the Lord at that time. But my oldest brother was invited by a neighbor boy to a, a local Baptist church. And it was going to be a father-son banquet. And my brother asked my dad to take him. My dad did not want to go. But wanting to be a better dad than his dad was to him, he said, all right, I'll go. So he took my brother to this banquet. And in the course of the evening, a gentle-hearted uh, man who knew the Lord cornered my dad and began sharing the love of Jesus. And as my dad would tell it, he said the tears just began running down his own face when he recognized that Jesus had died for him. And in that moment, that holy moment in that corner, my dad asked the Lord to come into his life and he surrendered his life to him. And um, my dad came home and of course full of enthusiasm shared the Lord with my mom, who was from a very strong Lutheran background. They both came to know the Lord, and life changed dramatically for us as a family. We all began attending church. At that time, there were six of us children. My dad and mom began what would have been called the old-fashioned family altar. We began praying together as a family, and uh, during one of those family altars is when I uh, came to know the Lord myself. And it was a chapter of tremendous growth in our family. We were living in the Chicago area, that's where I'm originally from, and three things stand out very significantly to me. Moody Bible Institute was very huge in our life. And uh, Saturday morning as a little child, I was very shy back then, and mom and dad said they would find me sitting behind a chair and I had that radio turned on from Moody Bible Institute on their Saturday morning programs to listen to uh, Billy Graham's pianist, Rudy Atwood, Paul Nicholson playing those rousing piano organ duets, and I was just mesmerized. So you see, there was something in there the Lord was preparing me for. <clears throat> I remember very profoundly, at 10, uh, 10 years old, we went to Moody Church in Chicago and um, Elizabeth Elliot spoke. Some of you are familiar with Elizabeth Elliot. It was uh, all over worldwide news, especially in the United States, when the three missionaries in that part of the jungle were martyred, her husband being one of them as they were trying to bring the gospel. And Elizabeth Elliot was there speaking and had brought back with her two of the Indians, Aka Indians, who had come to know the Lord. It was very profound to me as a young child to see the power of forgiveness. A third thing that was very impacting was my sister, my older sister and I, began going with my dad to the Chicago um, downtown mission. I think it was handled by Moody Church. So this was very impacting as an eight, nine year old when we would go to Chicago and help with the homeless. And there was a lot of drunks laying out on the street and my sister and I would sing during those little revival meetings there, Heaven Came Down and Glory Filled My Soul, that little duet. It was really profound to me and really shaping. In the summer of my seventh year, my parents and I went to a summer camp through our church. And um, my mom is one of 13 kids, number 11 down. And while we were there at that camp, uh, my mom received a call that her father had died. And mom and dad put us with another family, and mom and dad went back home to attend that funeral. And while they were attending that funeral, two days later, my brother died. Suddenly. Andy, the one I'm telling you about. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but what I can say is um, life dramatically changed for us men. And it 
began to be a new way of doing life, particularly as a family. My mother went over the edge and uh, became a very lost person and uh, was in and out of our lives. My older sister and I began taking on the role. We were young. We're talking eight, eight nine, ten years old. Began taking on the role as mother to our three and then four younger brothers and sisters. And so we had to grow up very quickly. We learned how to pull together in tough times without a mother present, but in and out again of our lives. Uh, she dealt with much inner turmoil, so naturally that spilled over to the family, and I think it really is true, hurting people hurt people. Nevertheless, we would pray together as a family. My dad would lead his children in praying for mom and encouraging each other. Sometimes we take two steps forward, sometimes a step back, sometimes one step forward, sometimes three back. But there was this steadiness. My father had the gift of evangelism when he came to know the Lord, and he was crazy about Jesus. So again, the spiritual impact on my life back then in the 1960s, you'd have vacuum, vacuum salesmen come by your houses, remember? And I, I'm a little child. But I was very close to my dad, and my dad would always invite anybody in who was selling something, because he had another thing in mind. <laughs> and he was always very polite. He'd listen to their whole story about, um, you know, the, all the benefits of this vacuum cleaner. And then just like Jesus at the woman of the well, he would turn that conversation to spiritual things. And I always knew it was going to happen, because when he ever be, he began to share Jesus, the tears began on his face. So as a little child, I'm looking up at his face and I thought, here it comes. <laughs> so there was often many times that dad would lead um, these people to the Lord. He just loved the Lord so much. <clears throat> In my childhood, there was a consistent perseverance through the trials. Times of great discouragement of where are you, God? Uh, I was a child, so I cannot fully understand all that was called upon for my dad to weather in some very tough years. But one I particularly remember is when I was just 13. Uh, uh, dad had probably come to the end of himself. Uh, we were seven children living um, alone. He feels probably very alone, but he's faithful and probably something just really discouraged him and he thought, I can't do this anymore. So I can still see Sue and I and my brothers and sisters standing on the back porch. Dad came out, loaded his suitcase in the car, and said, I can't do this anymore. And he took off. And he got halfway to Wyoming. Now remember, I don't have a mom at home. <laughs> so I'm thinking, what are we going to do? This was our rock, right? Dad tells us that he got halfway to Wyoming. And the Spirit of God was so convicting him. He said, you go back to those children. You go back home. I will give you the strength, I will give you the perseverance. And he was back home about three to four hours later, we collapsed in each other's arms. And it's precious. So many circumstances beyond his and our own ability to meet, much less to fix, so that really all we knew to do, it sounds so tremendously simple, doesn't it? But it's true. All we knew to do was to look up to Jesus and ask for strength. It's really just about Jesus. And so there was this learning to trust in the Lord and look to him in all things. We never outgrow that. It's like in all the hard times for us, God's love was on display through a father who only knew to look to Jesus. And so over those many years, Dad developed in such meekness, so in humility, so broken, and I mean that in the most honoring way, as he saw Christ in all. The virtues of my father's character as Christ transformed him from the inside out were modeled before us in real life circumstances. You know, it just wasn't saying it, it was living it in the hard places. So that the sweet aroma of Christ drew us children to the Lord. You would never know by looking at him all that had tried his heart and soul, for he possessed a courageous joy, a victorious outlook, and a perpetual smile. One of my devotionals that I read on a 
daily basis is springs in the valley. And I love this, what it says. The staunchest tree is not found in the shelter of the forest, but out in the open, where the winds from every quarter beat upon it and bend it and twist it until it becomes a giant in stature. It requires storms to produce the rooting. When you see a spiritual giant, think of the road over which he has traveled. Not the sunny land where wild flowers ever bloom, but a steep, rocky, narrow pathway where the blasts of hell will almost blow you off your feet, where the sharp, sharp rocks cut the feet, where the projecting thorns scratch, uh, scratch the brow, and the venomous serpents hiss on every side. The Lord produces deep roots where there are to be wide-spreading branches. My father's most profound modeling was showing us by example how to love our mother. His loving example through the years only grew and it made its imprint upon our souls where it continues this day. And I hear him saying so often, your mother is doing the best she can. <clears throat> I just wanted to show you this picture. This has hung in my home for many years in my bedroom. Um, when I was 13 years old, mom was not there. And I, I, the reason I have this hanging in my bedroom is because this is me in my heart. And this is not my mother, this is my father. And we lived in an old home on Wood Avenue, so it had those skeleton key locks. And I got up one morning early to get ready for school, and I heard crying often coming from my dad's office. And I would get down on my knees, and I would peer in that skeleton keyhole. And there was my father. All I could see through that image of the skeleton lock was my father on his knees at the ottoman. And he was praying out loud for each one of his children by name asking for God to protect us, asking for God to bless us, asking God to keep us close to him. And this was a every morning experience for my father. Again, I'm talking about impact on a child. When I was 47, 48 years old, Lauren and I were serving in a church in Northwest Arkansas. My mom and dad came to visit us. And I got up early morning one day in my running shoes and my hair in a ponytail and I the house dark because mom and dad were in the back room and I was coming down the hallway and uh, I stopped in the shadows because there was my dad on the love seat. He couldn't get down on his knees anymore because he was well into his 70s. Nevertheless, he was praying to the Lord for his children, for his many great-grandchildren by then, asking the Lord to protect them, keep them, lead them. And all I could think of that moment was, gosh, Dad, you're still praying for me. You're still praying for me all these years later. <clears throat> Twelve years ago, after my dad had a stroke here in Colorado Springs and then got stroke-related to dementia, I had a dream. My dad struggled along for probably a year and then was getting out in the middle of the night, um, not knowing where he was at. And, uh, we knew some changes were going to have to be made. And the, I had a dream one night that my father and mother were in this stream, like the streams are rushing right now with all this rain. And my father was going up and down in the water and crying out. And my mother was almost on top of him, dragging him down. But she was drowning too. And all I remember was I woke up crying and there was this thing of, your mom and dad are drowning. Now that's enough for one dream, but I had the same dream uh, two more times. And I knew the Lord was trying to impress me that your parents are drowning and they're needing your ch the children to come along beside. There was a lot of fear in me to be willing to be willing. Not that I didn't love my parents deeply, deeply but I knew before what the cost was going to be. I was concerned about my own health, but uh, we went up to Colorado, my sister and I, to survey the situation. And in that time, I was studying through the book of Isaiah. Remember, I'm dealing with great willingness, unwillingness. Lord, help me to be willing to be willing. 
I got up in the first morning in Colorado Springs. I stole away and I went to Isaiah. And I got in, I was reading through Isaiah chapter 1 again. And I got to verse 19. And you know when the Spirit of God speaks to you, right? And Isaiah 119 says, If you be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Well, boy, it just struck me. Leslie, I'm going to make you willing, but you're going to have to take the next step to be willing and obedient. And I promise you will eat the good of the land. Lauren and I moved mom and dad to live up near us in northwest Arkansas so I could undertake and oversee their care. It was a very precious, precious three years for Lauren and I. The Lord gave me a gift of those three years as dad faded from our lives. And when dad fell and broke his hip seven and a half years ago, it was several day days later that he went home to be with the Lord. He loved me as he was a gentle soul. And as he lay dying in the hospital there, Lauren and I regularly put the earphones in his ears. So you can picture him laying there with the earphones in his ears with God with us playing. And he's having a lot of pain, but I still remember him going, yes. Because he knew he was going to be seeing Jesus anytime soon. And that just thrilled his heart. And I realized when he passed away that morning, Dad, you've taught me how to live and you've taught me how to die. The last seven and a half years, I've continued to undertake for my mom's care, much challenge, much prayer, much perseverance, much love without measure. And even today, I continue to see the redeeming hand of the Lord in her life. And I realize he has taught me a depth of love I didn't know possible. She is now fading from our lives, and we, her children, remain assured that he who began a good work will complete it. Not only for my mom and dad, for us children. I get this visual often in life of a simple sifter. I think life is like a sifter. Things are poured into our life, circumstances, and they either pour through or they get caught along the edges. And God just does this. And he shakes loose the things in our life that are temporal, insignificant. Uh, there's always this shaking, isn't there? And the stuff continues to fall through. But in the end, there's granules left in there that won't pass through. They're gold that never perishes. And I'd just like to share with you in closing a few of those nuggets in my life after nearly 60 years. Number one, it really is God who is faithful to complete the good work. We come to him in childlike faith and surrender ourselves, and from that day forward, we are his. And he undertakes to grow us more and more in and like Jesus. What does Isaiah 64, 8 says? It says, like clay in the hands of the potter, so are we in his hands. It doesn't matter if I'm that seven-year-old child still crawling up into Jesus' lap or a 60-year-old woman. My part is still simply to yield and surrender as clay in the potter's hands and his part is to do. Amen. Secondly, there really is nothing that separates us from his love. And I won't go into that, but it's Romans 8, 28 and on. Nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from his love. And I've seen it powerfully. The power of prayer is number three. Who I am is because of someone who paid their price on their knees for many, many years who persevered through the hard, hard realities by God's grace and love and mercy. And the call remains with each of us to persevere in prayer for our children and our grandchildren. As you said, the days are growing dark. I think more than ever, we're going to need to stand on the word of God and know who we are. God honors the prayers of a righteous person. It was prayer that led my wonderful husband to me. We've shared in the joy of Christian ministry, but he has walked the joys in the hardest places in life by my side. And I realize I married my dad. The victory of faith, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And God continues to grow me into recognizing that seeing is not faith, hearing is not faith, Feelings are not faith. 
but believing when we can neither see nor feel is faith. Believing before we feel, and often against our feelings. If we would honor God, it is by our faith. Who puts the desires in our hearts in the first place? A man set out on his journey of life and all he knew was he wanted to be married to one woman for a lifetime and to spell love, T-I-M-E. He and my mom were married 57 years. He invested wisely into his children and his 23 grandchildren and now beyond his own life, 24 and counting great-grandchildren. And I know this is all by God's grace and mercy. Throughout my life, my siblings and my father, we heard my father often remark, with tears running down his cheeks, God has promised me something. God's promised me. He will restore the years that the locust has eaten. Do you see now why this promise is so significant in my life? And my siblings and I think of it often that he really is restoring the years that the locust has eaten. God didn't fully see the answers to his hard-won prayers. But like the psalmist David, he believed to see the goodness of the Lord, and he rested securely in the unwavering promises of God. And I know I won't see him either. It's ongoing, but it doesn't matter. I believe to see, and I will trust him who is faithful. I would ask in closing, if God brings my mother to your mind this week, we have a difficult week ahead of us. I know it potentially could end her life, but we're having to move her because of some difficulties where she's at, and we only have one option. So we're moving her there, and I would ask that you just pray for us, for God's strength. Um, I just brought a picture of my dad, if you want to see it later. This is in his... You see his smile and you see when he was fading from our life. But anyway, I thank you for the opportunity to share.